Hello, Hi. welcome to all of you all. And today I have a very interesting live conversation plan. With us is Mr. Hira Manik of Hira Manik and Son, who is consultant to Pandol. And along with him, we have Malika Sagar and Rob Dean. And both of them, they are specialist and auctioneer to Pandol, who will take us through their upcoming decorative art auction, which is scheduled to go live on fourth and fifth of August. So, guys, what is Pandol? Well, Pandol is a privately owned Mumbai-based auction house, which was founded in the year 2011. by a group of art professionals that collected and gathered the years of experience and expertise to offer indian art collectors a new platform and over the years pandol has been recognized as one of the leading auction houses specializing in indian art so we can't wait to see all the important decorative art and also the collection from mr adeshir hiramanik's private collection to begin with we would like to know that what is the auction all about and what are the dates for the auction so our auction of decorative arts includes objects from a wide variety of collecting categories they include silver furniture lights ceramics carpets wow. uh, indian silver indian silver etc mhm mm the auction will be held on two days as two different live sessions on august 4th and august 5th Okay. In the online, there will be no audience in the room because of the ongoing COVID regulations. And right. There will be one online session, which the auction is already open, and it will mm -hmm. run through the next one week. Um, the auction includes, of course, as you said, the bulk of the auction is from the collection of the late Adishir Hira Manik, Bernoulli's dad, and it also has a couple of other collections as well. Uh, a smaller collection from the Nanu Bai family, which I will tell you about a little bit later. and then of course various collecting uh, various things from different people who have chosen to sell with us rugs from one person robes nice. from the roshan sabha wala collection mm -hmm. silver from mm -hmm. another so it has something for everyone it has something mm -hmm. for the new young collector who's just moving into a new home it has mm -hmm. some, uh, things for you know older collectors who are looking for a specific piece of silver indian silver from a particular workshop and it has things at every price point as well I think Lovely. it's important to familiarize yourself with the catalog, look through, read about it, and of course right. come to us with any questions you may have. Is there a preview arranged for for the people who are at least in Mumbai or visiting Mumbai? Can they drop yeah. by and see the pieces? Yes. So we started the preview a couple of days ago, and it will run through the third of August. You are okay. welcome to come by after making an appointment. You can contact mm -hmm. us on email, on the telephone, on Instagram, whatever Perfect. works for you. And mm -hmm. if you are based out of town. we've been doing lots of video calls zoom calls that's become the order of the day over the last 18 months or so because of the situation we are in so that's not unusual and our instagram also has lots of uh, moving views 360 yes. views of the room you know so you can always ask us to for more details should you need and we can arrange to show it to you perfect i'm going to begin with what we think is the most exciting piece in the auction i'm going yes, to please. go over to my colleague rob who is going right. to tell you about our cover lot I mm -hmm. will you in his extremely capable hands. <laughs> of course he is. <laughs> hi Rob, how are you? Hi, hi. <laughs> so we're very excited uh, to mm -hmm. have this bronze from uh, the Hiramanek collection. Nice. Um, it's uh, a 14th century Tibetan bronze uh, mm -hmm. from the monastic uh, area of Densetil in central Tibet. Um, in 1170, Dorje Gyalpo, who was one of the leading Buddhist thinkers of the time, passed away. Mm -hmm. His followers and the monks that uh, had been learning under him decided to build a memorial stupa in his honor, and so began a period of great expansion in Densetil, uh, which continued through the 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries. Okay. This bronze mm -hmm. is. Um, A oh. deity um, right. from the late 14th century. Uh, the the treatment of the robes, in particular, this pendant sash, yes. these flower patterns, all clearly identify and associate the bronze with the site of Densetil. 
Absolutely. Uh, what is more complicated is actually the identity of the deity itself. Mm -hmm. um, both Parnashavari, who is the goddess of pandemics, so we mm -hmm. should all be praying to her at present. Yes, and, let's all pray uh, to her. <laughs> and Arya Janguli, who is the goddess of, uh, who protects us from snake bites, so also a useful goddess to have around, um, <laughs> are very similar in terms of their iconography. Both of them hold a Vajra in one hand, which you can see up here. Mm -hmm. Both hold a bow and arrow. There's a, yes. a stem of an arrow that is still remaining here. And in this hand, there would have been a bow, which is now mm -hmm. missing. Mm -hmm. So uh, both of the, all of those attributes would suggest that it could be Arya Ganguly or Parma Um e Equally, the, the, um, the skirt, which is decorated with flowers and, and mm -hmm. um, leaves, are attributes of both uh, deities. The problem is that Arya Ganguly would normally have um, a sword in one hand, which we cannot see, a crown of snakes. Here, uh, here we have My the God. crown of the five Buddhas. But interestingly, if we look at the back of the bronze, yes, we can see a little broken stem here, which may have once had the, the uh, hood of snakes attached to it. So mm -hmm. it, it is difficult to now tell you 600 years later um, whether or not it's uh, Parnashavari or Arya Gangu. Fantastic. Um, it's, it's the Denstil Monastery, unfortunately, was destroyed in the Cultural Revolution. So all of these pieces um, have, were widely dispersed and are now held in museums and private collections around the world. Mm -hmm. Most recently, the Asia Society had a show in New York uh, called The mm -hmm. Golden Visions of Densitil a few years ago, which really gave a prominence to the world and an awareness of this amazing monastery. This uh, bronze was photographed at the monastery in the 1940s by Giuseppe Tucci. So mm -hmm. we actually know exactly where it was in the monastery, Interesting. which is really remarkable today. It was seated alongside another bronze, uh, which is now in the Kinney collection, um, mm -hmm. which is also which is of Parnashivari, which, in my opinion, makes this bronze probably more likely to be Arya Ganguly, but uh, still it is very much open to scholastic debate. Um, in terms of uh, the the placement of these bronzes, they mm -hmm. were placed on stupas uh, that were built over a period of about 400 years. This okay. was placed on the stupa next to Parnashivari, uh, which is the third Tashi Goma, which, is, um, uh, which was built at the end of the 14th century. So we're okay. extremely excited to have this in your yes. sale. Um, <laughs> and it's uh, an amazing opportunity for domestic buyers in India to buy a piece of the Densitil history. Now I'm going to hand you over to Menosh, who okay. can tell you a little bit more about uh, his father's collection, yes. uh, the collecting habits of his family. Oh, how are you? Hi, hi, how are you? <laughs> Very well. So we're looking forward to witnessing all the exclusive silver ornaments and the objects that you have curated at this auction. Okay, so... Um... Let me start by saying that my dad was a very passionate collector. Mm -hmm. His passion used to be objects of Indian art, like bronzes, stones, sculpture. And he was obsessed with all types of silver, whether yes. it be European or Oriental. His main passion in silver was really good quality Indian silver. Mm -hmm. And he was very, very, very passionate about English hallmark silver. Lovely. English Hallmark Silver, I'm not sure if everyone knows, but it's the only silver in the world that you can actually tell the exact year of manufacture at the city in the UK or, or where it was made. So, um, he never really had a kind of focus in what he was collecting. He just used to buy what he liked and he used to sell some, he used to keep some. Mm -hmm. And we are now putting up a part of his collection for sale. Um, amongst the silver, this is really, I think, an absolutely outstanding piece yes. of vintage Indian silver from the, 
design and from the quality of the workmanship mm -hmm. we would be almost sure that this is made in pune which used to be called pune before the pune workshop there is a strong possibility that this could be the workmanship of a silversmith known as gill but we can't say for sure so mm -hmm. it has a lot of attributes of gill to it um what is amazing about this piece is the high relief work that okay. you see on all the panels now there are times when you can get silver pieces with even higher relief wow but there is a lot of crudity in mm -hmm. a lot of them while in this case there are no signs of crudity at all the workmanship is absolutely exquisite it is um there are five panels mm -hmm. the panels have been taken from oleographs by the raja ravi nice. varma studio lovely uh the names of the oleographs are sita bhumi pravesh varvasi mm -hmm. ram mm -hmm. uh uh ashesh narayan the victory of indrajit and kanya maya wow if one uh looks at this uh closely Mm -hmm. one can see the quality of the relief work i mean it's absolutely exquisite honestly i don't think workmanship on indian silver can get any better than this yes okay even if you look at the base over here you see the relief of the animals it's absolutely exquisite so this is really quite an amazing piece of uh, vintage silver then we can move on to this beautiful beautiful silver tray Mm -hmm. Made in Kashmir. Mm -hmm. um, nice. One can sort of see when a piece is made in Kashmir because of the chinar leaves, yes. uh, which is typical of what you see on Kashmir silver. Yes. Kashmir silver was started. I mean, they started making silver in Kashmir in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. and a lot of indian royalty used to order silver from kashmir by way of dinner sets or even tea sets trays bowls center pieces etc mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, here again you see a lot of carving beautiful and yes. a nice tray which could be used really just for decorative purposes or even for collectability because wow. it's not just decorative but it's also collectible how long you think the entire craftsmanship may have taken back then you know when the resources were very limited i would guess i think they would take at least a couple of months to make something like this because it's all hand work hand made yes absolutely yeah, absolutely mm -hmm. hand work so they have to first visualize it and then actually put it wow. into production so um, i think it would definitely take 2 to 3 months to make something like this wow then we can move on to this other beautiful piece of indian silver it's a box mm -hmm. from rajasthan mm -hmm. um you can see the carved the pierced panels over here yes very very beautiful similar also to work from kutch gujarat but this is more sort of prominent of work in rajasthan wow on the top of the box it's got a beautiful seated lion yes from its flora and fauna mm -hmm. and one can see you know the the period and the age even when you open the box it's it's quite yes. beautiful even from mm -hmm. inside mm -hmm. so a lot of really beautiful silver used to be made in rajasthan mm -hmm. and very very highly collectible so right. people who collect indian silver definitely want a few pieces from rajasthan from kashmir something That's like sweet. this in their collections mm -hmm. to sort mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. get a good mix how have you maintained the quality and the polishing of these objects because i believe that they must be really very old since they were collected by your father but honestly these pieces have just been in storage and they come out once in a while and then they go back okay. in storage mm -hmm. so i would say that the condition of whatever we have up for auction is yes. really quite pristine and uh, if clients want to know specific things about uh, specific pieces they mm -hmm. can always ask for a condition report and we would give them a okay. very detailed condition report as okay. to what the condition is whether there is some damage whether there is some mm -hmm. restoration or mm -hmm. whether it's absolutely perfect condition is already online 
Okay, and uh, my colleague Malika here says that the condition reports are already online for each and every. Perfect. Case. There has been quite a few questions asking about the pricing. So, I mean, how do we direct our audience to know the pricing of any of the lots which they are interested in? So, Renu, I'll give you a, a small example. We had quite a few people in this morning, mm -hmm. and I think people are very, very happy with the way we have priced uh, all the objects in the auction. It's right. a very conservative pricing. Mm -hmm. um, today, if one goes into the open market or into a retail space to buy something like this, first of all, you mm -hmm. won't get it. And leave, you won't get it yes. anywhere close to the prices that we have put in as estimates. Is that Fantastic. the question you asked me or was it something else? Yes, that was a part of the question. But uh, audience wants to know about the price, you know, price of a particular lot. So I believe that uh, they can get all the details from your website. Yes, all the catalogs are online in three okay, Malika. sessions depending mm -hmm. on where they are being offered in the sale. Right. We also have a Pantos app which you could download on your phone whether you have an Apple phone or an Android and you can follow all the catalogs there as well. You mm -hmm. can always call us and ask for a physical Perfect, catalog. Perfect Malika. Too. So you have okay. actually several options. It's just a question of what you prefer. Um, and then okay. back to Manush, telling me a little bit more yes. about his dance. So, yes. <laughs> then we get into a few very collectible pieces of English Hallmark silver. Over here, there are two boxes, mm -hmm. which were known as snuff boxes. Mm -hmm. Snuff boxes first came into production in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. And they were invented by a pair of Dutch brothers. Um... They were mainly used for carrying a few grams of snuff in your pocket. The smaller boxes were meant for personal consumption and the larger mm -hmm. boxes were meant for group consumption. This pair of boxes are made by a British silversmith known as Nathaniel Mills. Mm -hmm. uh, Nathaniel Mills was a very, very famous British silversmith. And he specialized in the most beautiful snuff boxes, vinaigrettes, card cases, and table boxes. If you see the workmanship here, we have two examples of his work. Yes. One is dated Birmingham 1836, and one wow. is dated Birmingham 1830. So we're looking at like 200 years old almost. Amazing, amazing. And see the quality of the workmanship yes. here on the side. Mm -hmm. And these are the British wow. hallmarks over here. Mm -hmm. So from these English hallmarks, you can tell the exact year of manufacture, where in the UK it's been made, and the period, like whether it's Victorian, Edwardian, Georgian, etc. So these are two really good examples of English silver snuff boxes. Mm -hmm. Then we can move ahead to other snuff boxes here, which are made by two very famous companies, one being Tiffany and the other Aspen. Wow. So here again, uh, this one has a pattern which is known as engine turning. Mm -hmm. It's very, very uh, sort of British and um, beautifully, beautifully made. Yes. This is the one by Asprey. Mm -hmm. And then there is one here by Tiffany. Look at that. Most of these snuff boxes were gold plated from inside. Yes. So this would be real gold plating. And you can see nice relief work on it. And is there a reason why they have gold plating on the inside and silver on the outside? No, I think it was a sort of a British tradition. They used to always gold plate the insides of, very often of silver snuff boxes, of the sugar and milk jugs and tea and coffee sets. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and then we move on to what we have here, which are known as vinaigrettes. Now, a vinaigrette is like a snuff box with a uh, uh, pierced uh, interior lid. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in the old days, I know my grandmother wow. used to use one. Wow. You open this, in the old days, you used to put perfumed cotton wool inside. Okay. And then whenever they felt faint or whenever they wanted to feel nicer, they would just wow. sniff in the perfume mm -hmm. and yeah. then put it back into their purses. So these are all Chinese export silver. So they're made for the export markets. Mm -hmm. 
And all these examples over here are examples of Chinese silver. Uh, three of them are marked by the, uh, with the marks of the maker Mun Qi, who was a very famous Chinese export silversmith. Wow. They're very collectible today. I mean, people may not right. necessarily use them, but they're highly right. collectible. But what detailing do we have on the inside? Do we see some, um, some carving? On the outside, it's a lot of floral design. Okay. And on the inside, again, the pierced work is floral yes. corner kind of stuff. Yeah. Interesting. Really amazing. And truly work of art. It's so difficult to even have a look at these exclusive pieces right now. And they're all so well maintained. They're almost 200 years old. And as you mentioned, that they're not too expensive. That is, that is really true. That is honestly true. I think anybody who is a collector mm -hmm. will know for a fact that the prices that we put in are very, very conservative. You mentioned and used the word collector. You've shown us such amazing work of art. What advice would you like to give to collectors who, you know, who are looking to purchase some of these decorative arts and objects? I would honestly say just go with what you like. That's the motto my dad always had and that's what yes. I have. I mean, if you yes. like something, buy it. Don't buy it just because it's rare or because right. you think it's collectible. Buy it because you like it and build up your own collection. That's Lovely. the right way to go about it. Okay, so now I'll hand you back to Malika okay. who will Thank talk you. about the art boy collection. Yes. Thank you. So we heard about the Iramani collection. We have a second yes. slightly smaller collection, also primarily of silver and a few mm -hmm. other uh, porcelain and glass objects as well. Uh, Nanakoi used to be a jeweler in the 1940s in Bombay and mm -hmm. was very much associated with the royal families of the time for whom he was, he would always make jewelry. So in the 1940s when he began, he had the good luck of meeting the Maharaja of Gwalia, who was getting married at the time. And mm -hmm. it was this interaction that really got him started, and after which he was able to open a store in 1942. Yes. The lifestyle of that time, as you can see from some of the objects that even Renosh has shown you here, or as you can see from the objects here that you will see on the table, were very different from what we use today. They lived a much grander lifestyle, it was a right. more opulent lifestyle because of the royal families and nobility at the time. And jewelers like Nanukai not only made things for them, commissioned things for them in jewelry, but also in the luxury goods sector. So it could include silver, it could include ceramics, etc. So some of the highlights of this collection, for example, are mm -hmm. the candelabra that we see here. These are also mm -hmm. English hallmark silver that have been gilded, similar to what Mernosh was saying to you. Yes. And we will give you the history of English hallmark silver. Rob will talk to you about that in a, in a few minutes. But these are by a maker named Charles Frederick Hancock, and they are from 1873. So it gives mm -hmm. you a very nice example of the lifestyle that they led in the 1940s and 1950s. This would have been on somebody's sideboard, exactly like they are now. They were in the Nanubai household on the sideboard. Wow. They entertained a lot. They enjoyed entertaining. They, other people would come and enjoy their hospitality. Their food was also legendary. They came for the company. They came for the, the just the entire experience because that was what they all enjoyed at the time. So if you see here, we have a whole set. This was how their table would be laid. This wow. is a set of thalis <laughs> that yes. were made and commissioned for them at the time. And you mm -hmm. can see the design. You can see the detailing here. Very simple, very much okay. in keeping with 1940s art deco. But there's mm -hmm. a nice heft to all the thalis. They're, not, they're very nicely made. They're very right. solid. You have the bowls as well. And it's a 12-seater seater thali. But it gives you a sense of the lifestyle that was being lived at the time. And, Absolutely. Uh, the story goes that Mrs. Tata was often a guest at their home. And when she opened the Tanjore restaurant at the Taj Mahal, she modeled it, the non-vegetarian thali, along these lines. Wow. So it was just... It's a very nice example of beautiful, beautiful objects, both Indian and non-Indian, from a bygone age. And of course, all the royal families and things would, of course, love Indian pieces and would encourage Indian craftsmen. But they were also very keen to show that they had a sophistication that went beyond India. 
which is why right. they would like English Hallmark Silver or they like Osler like we will see in a few minutes or Bakara mm -hmm. or Lalique or other very well known nice. Western luxury makers as well. We're just going to talk a little bit about some other modern Indian silver pieces also from the Nanuai collection that again give you a bit of a peek into the lifestyle that they led at the time. This is a beautiful 14 karat gold cocktail shaker. It's a mini cocktail shaker with a mm -hmm. tray mm -hmm. and two glasses. And they have been engraved with the owner's initial here. So you can see that there's an N. There's also a beautiful silver thermos and a tiffin, which nice. you know the young girl would take to school every day, you know, with three little boxes in it as well. <laughs> So, I mean, things that we may not use today or we would certainly not use in silver. It just gives you a very nice sense of how Indian silver was made at the time and what kind of tastes and sophistication they were catering to. We also right. have a lovely example of modern silver with this pan box, which is nice and shaped as a yes. mango. Mm -hmm. And again, very nice weight to it. Very simple yeah. lines. It's not very ornate, unlike some of the silver uh, that Menosh was showing you from Rajasthan and things. Yes. But equally impressive in terms of just the lines used and the craftsmanship and again right. it opens and it has a little pan dabbi inside right. you know and of course this will also come open these open up as well mm -hmm. so very charming little objects not always mm -hmm. entirely practical but why does yes. life have to be practical it has to be beautiful too right it has to be beautiful too very rightly said malika <laughs> uh, i'm going to take you now to rob who's going to talk to you a little bit about English Hallmark Silver, since there are so many pieces of English Hallmark Silver in the auction, and he's going to explain to you the history. We're using a few other pieces from the sale. Hi, Rob. Hi again. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> um, may not sure briefly uh, touched upon English Hallmark Silver. We have mm -hmm. quite a range in the sale, um, and uh, the tradition mm -hmm. dates back as as far as 1158. Um, when Henry II, the King of England, um, decided that his coins required uh, a standardization process. Mm -hmm. and at that point, 92.5% silver became the sterling silver standard. So Henry II started with his coins, not with items, just with, with coinage. And then Henry III said that all silver items should have the same standard. Mm -hmm. um, and that system therefore evolved over time to the English hallmark system that we have today which actually has four stamps on it which has um, the stamp to prove that it's silver the uh, place name uh, the date and the maker's mm -hmm. mark and mm -hmm. here we have two fantastic examples of Georgian silver um, this is the earlier uh, piece um, a right. terrine, terrine with lid mm -hmm. um, probably for for soups and uh, this is this is from uh, 1807 a london maker wow. john eames this is uh, somewhat later uh, 1830 also london um by the the maker benjamin smith mm -hmm. you can see that over time styles and tastes even uh, within london change quite dramatically you have very sort of minimalistic, almost a contemporary mm -hmm. look in, the, in this uh, the, um, piece from 1800. Um, mm -hmm. But by towards the middle of the century, you get this much more flamboyant Rococo style, um, which really has very high detailing, which is typical not only of the silverware, but also if you look at, um, say, the royal carriages in, in the Queen's collection, you, you get this very flamboyant period in the mid-19th mid century. Mm -hmm. Um, and these are really remarkable examples and well, they very, indeed um, are very uh, uh, delightful pieces. At about the same period that these were being produced, manufactured in, in the UK, uh, you also have, of course, silver being produced all around the world. And here we have two examples of, of silver from um, uh, South Asia. So we have nice. a Nepalese box here. Mm -hmm. um, with, you know, I don't know if you can see that, uh, a Durga slaying the buffalo demon on, on the top yes. of the box. Um, mm -hmm. And this would, is a sort of trinket box that, that um, is very typical uh, of the late 19th, early 20th century um, from Nepal. 
whereas here we have a Burmese, Burmese. offering bowl. Yes. Now, although uh, this is in the shape of uh, the alms bowls that the Buddhist monks in, in Myanmar go right. through every day out from the monastery to beg for their food, this is the typical yes. shape of the bowl. Of course, mm -hmm. uh, in Theravada Buddhism, the monks are not allowed to hold silver, so they wouldn't have been actually okay. um, uh, allowed to use this as their begging bowl. But it, the shape <laughs> has, is, is what has been um, adopted by the uh, Burmese artisans. And then you have these wonderful dancing figures mm -hmm. all around the yes. bowl itself. Great work of art. So you get you get a very good sense of, of the different regional varieties within the same. Absolutely. Sale. Um, yes. I think uh, um, Menosh and, and Malika have already talked about several of them. Um, so now I'm going to hand you back to Menosh to talk about some porcelain. Thank you. Not at all. Hi again. Hello. Hello. So over here we have a variety, a small sort of selection of Chinese as well as Japanese porcelain. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll begin with these two fairly large, beautiful Chinese export porcelain bowls mm -hmm. uh, with full lions. Yes. Uh, painted in underglazed colors. Wow. And we have at the bottom a mark in underglazed red. Yes. These probably date back to the 19th century, so I would say approximately 1880 to 1900. Um, see the quality of the workmanship here, yes. the painting, the enameling is absolutely exquisite. Very interesting. And it's got this Greek sort of key pattern on the top. Mm -hmm. And these are Chinese cool lions all around. Mm -hmm. And also wow. on the inside. Nice. All this is painted in underglazed colors with golds and reds and grays. So there's a pair mm -hmm. of these. Okay. Um, due to the extensive trade between India and China, mm -hmm. a lot of Chinese porcelain came into India. This was mainly because there was a lot of trade between Parsi families living in China and uh, okay. families living in India. Mm -hmm. So a lot of Chinese porcelain entered India during this period from the 1880s onwards and mm -hmm. there is a fair abundance of it available in, in, in India today, only it's getting less and less, particularly it's difficult to find pieces in pristine quality like for example these two bowls. Apart from uh, the quality, I think the size is also of importance right. and these would be I think approximately 10 inches in diameter, which wow. is unusual and it's mm -hmm. also unusual to get a pair at the same time. Mm -hmm. Then we move on, let's say, to another Chinese piece. Uh, we have two lots of these late Ming Chinese styles in blue and white. Mm -hmm. um, I have actually seen palaces in Rajasthan where entire yes. rooms, all the four mm -hmm. walls are tiled with tiles like this. Um, these are the late Ming period from the 1300s to the 1600s. Mm -hmm. And over here you can see in underglazed blue there is a very stylized blossom. Mm -hmm. Each of the blossoms have eight sort of petals mm -hmm. and they're surrounded by these stylized leaves. Um, today, one can use them even as posters on the dinner table, as wall decorations, mm -hmm. or actually as styles as they were supposed to be used. That's the back, as you can see. So these would have probably come off a wall at some time, you know, from a palace mm -hmm. or from a palatial home or an estate. So we are offering in our sale two lots with a mm -hmm. fairly decent uh, uh, amount of these styles. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another Chinese planter here, which is absolutely beautiful. Okay. I'll drop a little so that you can see the uh, this is known as Chinese Famil Rose. Okay. So, Famil Rose, th this one would be probably about 1880 to 1900, late 19th mm -hmm. century. Mm -hmm. Again, Chinese export. Mm -hmm. Famil Rose indicates that it has mainly shades of pink. 
and this was also is in perfect condition see the uh, enameling yes. it's absolutely beautiful the various various shades of pink and carmine yes and this would have been a planter but one can use it just for decorative purposes also today it looks amazing yes. when it's put on a pedestal it kind of makes the room look totally different uh, then we can move to japanese pottery for example we have this absolutely stunning happy man or a happy buddha <laughs> kind of yes. thing mm -hmm. uh, this is what is known as imperial satsuma imperial satsuma is satsuma which has thicker enamels in lapis blue yeah. in red mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. heavy gold mm -hmm. as you can see here again if you take the camera close and you see the details on the face the facial hair yeah. the eyebrows yeah. Yeah. the chest it's yeah. just i mean you can't get better than this honestly it's just beautiful see the workmanship at the back it's worked all over mm -hmm. and over here is the mark by the japanese uh, uh artist who made this uh in our catalog we have the details of the mark and uh satsuma basically was a province in japan in which this sort of pottery was made Mm -hmm. and a lot of it was made for consumption within japan and a lot of it was exported another planter over here a small one which again is satsuma the same thing again imperial yes. wow. it has these panels with these kind of fans painted with imperial colors of blues reds and golds mm -hmm. yes. and a beautiful mark at the bottom again of the maker who probably maker. made it mm -hmm. so in the province of Satsuma, of satsuma there were various families and various workshops where this used to be made mm -hmm. and at the bottom or on the sides of most of these pieces you will have a mark which can be deciphered and uh, they will tell you exactly which workshop or which family this has been made from right from here mm -hmm. we have an amazing selection of art nouveau glass here fantastic by lali rahe lali nice. actually yes um so over here we have a bowl and a plate mm -hmm. uh these are known as ondines mm -hmm. that's the name of the design they have these maidens floating around uh this is what is called opalescent glass so mm -hmm. it looks like an opaline sort of color mm -hmm. okay each of these mm -hmm. is marked our lalique france nice and yes, these would be pre 1940s 1940s wow yeah and uh Here we have another vase by uh, this known as the Rampillon. Mm -hmm. um, again, very very beautiful opalescent yes. glass, as you yes. can see from. If you mm -hmm. look at opalescent glass from different angles, you will see different colors emanating from. And we can also see some detailing on the glass. Yeah, it has some beautiful yes. uh, workmanship of leaves and flowers. on nice. etched into the glass and Wonderful. again marked on the base our lalique meaning rene lalique so rene nice. lalique was a very 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 famous french uh, artist who used to make the most fabulous glass he also used to deal with ceramics furniture yes. and he used to make the most amazing flicajour jewelry which was Wonderful. transparent enamel yes. with the uh, um a very very art nouveau sort of style a very flowy mm -hmm. style and we have a great collection over here of emil gale and dom mm -hmm. both of them very very famous uh, french artists uh for example this is what would be known as cameo glass mm -hmm. um 
the right way to display this actually is with a bulb inside bulb, the whole thing right. lights up and mm -hmm. you get a completely different uh, uh, sort of view of it um, all these pieces are signed over here there is mm -hmm. a signature of Galay mm -hmm. okay. yeah nice yes and you see the quality of the etching and the cameo work done on the glass it's exquisite these particularly are very rare to find in India. The supply mm -hmm. of galley and dome, the vintage galley and dome, uh, is much more outside India than it is in India. In India, I would wow. say it's very rare to get a selection of uh, galley and dome like this available under one roof at one time. Mm -hmm. So, um, all these are galley, okay? Mm -hmm. And this one is a fairly large very beautiful example of dome. Nice. Dome still exists today, but this is the mm -hmm. early dome. Early dome. And this is marked Dome Nancy, mm -hmm. which is the place in which dome used to have their workshops. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So you've actually taken us from India, Rajasthan, Kutch, to Japan, to China, to France, to London. To every part of the world. Especially at the time when we can't travel. So exactly, think... especially at the time. <laughs> so I think that calls for a great round of applause to the entire team for working yeah. in so hard and for curating this amazing auction for all of us. A question to Malika, how did the team go about curating these special objects, you know, from every part of the world? So let me just say one thing here, nothing is impossible for Malika. <laughs> she's, she's known as the sexiest auctioneer in India. <laughs> 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 so nothing is impossible for us. All <laughs> great job, Malika. Great work. Seriously, we had really uh, called for a great round of applause. It's fantastic. No, um, we work uh, very much as a team, and we can't do right. any of our decorative art sales without our no, very no, no, consultant no, 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 here. No, 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 no. But uh, <laughs> the way it works is, it's not so much about us curating auctions, are not are less about curating and more about working with the consigners who come to you to try right. and get values on their pieces if they are mm -hmm. interested in selling. So mm -hmm. the, the way a collection comes together sometimes is a bit of good luck. Sometimes you have, right. a, say, in a few pieces, if you already have a lot of satsuma, you won't take more. You try and balance it right. out with some Chinese mm -hmm. pieces, some European Absolutely. pieces. You try and give everybody a fair chance. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is more about what comes our way, who we try and approach because we know people are interested in selling. Right. Um, it's mm -hmm. not about choice. It's not about trying to tell a story. Once we have everything in an auction, then we tell right. a story. So Amazing. We don't try and tell the story before we get the pieces. So we, we don't know where we're going until right. Rob and I sit with, you know, everything in front of us, hold our head in our hands and say, oh, God, <laughs> um, but great work. Rob was going to take you to a new part of the world and a new category altogether and tell you a little bit about some of the furniture we have in here. This is probably, yes. uh, in terms of the furniture, one of the highlights from the sale. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, anglo um so very typical wow. of, of uh, late 19th, early 20th century uh, furniture, both made in India and in, in, in Burma. What's particularly striking about the piece are these uh, female figures that form the legs of the of, mm -hmm. of the of the uh, console table. Yes, um, yes. So they're very striking and have a very uh, Indo-Portuguese feel. You'll also see this style of, of, of figure on some of the Goan pieces uh, that uh, appeared at a similar period in time, which shows the cross-cultural influences. So style of furniture. Yes. Um, in, in Bombay in 1937, there was the first uh, uh, Homes and Interiors show. Mm -hmm. And that show brought in a new form of uh, modernism, really, to, to it, which combined some of the Art Deco styles of Europe with um, a localized modernism, which was very much about clean lines in, in a somewhat industrial feel. And both these uh, chairs and this dining table with its industrial elements to it are very typical of that style and period. And um, I think they're very charming examples in the sale. Oh, they're great examples. <laughs> uh, and then one more piece over here, which is from 
France, um, a French decorative cabinet with all of these decorative elements, which is um, really remarkable. Yes. And yes. these lovely curved glass vitrines, oh. what really makes it uh, very striking. Yes. And I think we're running out of time, and if you have any final questions for the team or uh, mm -hmm. anyone, then let us know. We're here, we're here until the sale. Uh, okay. We're on with you, and we can uh, be contacted via yes. email yes. or phone. Or yes. There have been quite a few questions from the audience asking about the prices, asking if can anyone get into buying these things. So yes, you all can get all the information either from their website or you can contact them, DM them, you know, you'll have all the answers. And Malika, some end notes or some end words that you would like to share with our audience? Um, well, I hope it's been informative and educational. It has been, it has been. Idea. It's not so much necessarily about buying at this stage, right. but it's lovely to learn about new things. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, even a small piece sometimes can enhance a corner of a home or right. can get you interested in a particular collecting category. So don't be afraid to come forward. Don't be afraid to come and view. It doesn't mean you have to buy. Don't be intimidated by the word. Right. Just come right. and learn. I think that's a great start. How point. sweet. So thank you so much, Malika. And Mr. Hiramanik, some words from you. So like I said, um, We've put together, I think, a fair amount of fabulous yes. stuff under one roof. And mm -hmm. uh, like Malika rightfully said, it's not just uh, the question of buying. We right. are open for anybody to come and view the things till, I think, Monday? Right? Tuesday. 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 Fantastic. So everyone is welcome. You can come, have a look, ask us questions. We're happy to mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. And if at the end of it you feel like you want to put in a bid, you're welcome to. If not, we can always enter into Perfect. a relationship. Perfect. And finally, Rob, some words of advice or some, some expertise from you? Uh, well, I wouldn't have words of advice. I, I would have words of warning. <laughs> um, <laughs> art, art, as all of us will agree, and uh, the decorative arts, is actually an addiction. Disease. Right. So it's a disease. It so, so please come, but yes. with a health warning underneath. <laughs> <laughs> it can become a Fantastic. It's a lovely, it's a lovely thought. <laughs> yes. So, all right. So thank you, Malika. Thank you, Mr. Hiramanik. And thank you, Rob. And thank you, Neha and the entire team who's helped us curate this really amazing, informative life conversation. And and wish you all the very best. Thank you for having us. Thank you. 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 Th